MSG, what it do? <laughs> yes, yes, y'all. Um, we got any 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 hip hop artists in the, in the house right now? How about uh, salute? How about activists? Right on. How about students? All right. How about students of life? Okay. So we got a lot of shit in common already. Um, I'm grateful to be here. I got a couple slides. I'm going to attempt to be over there and over here. So uh, we're going to make it work. But um, so let me get my slide game up. And my partner, M1, um, is going to alley hoop, you know, after I um, say a little bit to y'all about uh, why we're here today. Um, a little bit about me as I get this slide on deck. Um, Athena, can you? Oh, there we go. So um, a little bit about me real quick, though. Um, I'm Stick. My real name is Kanum Ibomu. Um, I've been married for 21 years. Uh, um, I got a 13-year-old son. Uh, I'm in the holistic health and fitness and martial arts and meditating and running and all that good stuff. And I love doing music, of course, right? So just a little two cents on me. But today, I want to I wanna, I wanna talk to you all about something. The first thing I want to do is introduce you to a book. Anybody ever read The Art of War by Sun Tzu? Anybody ever studied The Art of War by Sun Tzu? Anybody ever applied The Art of War by Sun Tzu? Right on. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, for those that may be unfamiliar with the book, you know, it's basically a 2,000-year-old classic uh, in, in strategy, right? And it's, it's based on um, principles of preparation, planning, uh, and taking care of business before you take care of business, right? So um, of, of the many things that the Art of War talks about, I think one of the key principles and themes in there is the notion that the highest martial art, the highest strategy, right, is fighting without fighting, right? Dig that. In the Art of War, the highest art is fighting without fighting. So what's, what's Sun Tzu talking about when he's saying fighting without fighting? You know, um, let's, when we look at war, war is any conflict, right? It's any campaign. It's anything that we want to accomplish that we have to overcome certain challenges uh, to make that happen. So the brilliance of this book that's used in all of the corporate, you know, big corporate companies, uh, the highest military academies around the world today, 2,000 years, is that they, Sun Tzu was able to break down, you know, the notion of fighting without fighting, meaning minimizing conflict, right, but maximizing your effectiveness, right? So I wanted to uh, basically set up my, my talk today um, inspired by the art of war, and that notion of minimizing conflict, but maximizing effectiveness, right? So let me see, can I get to this other slide? Um, boom. So I want to talk about how the art of war applies to hip hop and activism, right? Um, art and activism, that's been my battlefield for the last 20 years. You know what I mean? Since Sixth grade, I was emceeing, um, got kicked out of high school, and, and that put me right into the community struggle uh, for self-determination. You know, I became a entrepreneur for the last 15 years, you know what I mean? So in, in that process of working with my partner, we've, um, we've had a lot of experiences working as artists and as activists. You know, I've been a member of the Yuhuru movement, Democratic, you know, African rights organization. And so in that, I want to share with y'all five strategies and tactics that we've seen be effective either personally or 
in the movements we've been around, you know, for your hip hop, for your activism, for your art. You know what I mean? I thought it'd be better than just philosophizing, but actually putting it in an actionable context, something we can take with us, right? So, um, so yeah, let's get it popping on uh, number one of the five strategies. Well, let me show you these. So these are the five strategies. Take over, be the change, skill the messenger, common ground, and lifestyle. That's what I'm gonna break down, so. All right, the takeover. Tactic one. We first came up with this concept of the takeover in um, when we started the Turn Off the Radio mixtape series, right? And we started saying that it's a takeover, not a makeover, right? And what we would do is we would take popular songs at the time and snatch that, like Ice Cube said, give me that beat. It's a jack move, homie. And we would put our message on that beat. So, for example, Aaliyah had a song called We Need a Resolution. And me and my homie said, we need a revolution, right? Give me that, take over. Black Rob had a song called That's Woe, and my comrade M, he created That's War, right? So, you know, cops stop you just because you're black, that's war. When you fingerprints through the system, that's war. You know what I mean? So that was a, a, a technique, a tactic that we used uh, to take over something that was popular and make it our own, right? So, and, you know, basically using remix as a rebellion. Um, and that's, that's the latest drama we did, Revolutionary by Gangsta Girls, where we took over the Gangsta Girl brand with DJ Drama with our brand. Also, you can see, and as an example, how we taken over the red, black, and green and added the bandana, you know what I mean, just to make it more relevant to today and our experiences. So, so, in a nutshell, those are some strategies in the art of war for what we do with our culture, with hip hop. Take over, be the change, skill the messenger, common ground, and make it a lifestyle. Um, I sum up with this, man. Art and activism is about making change artfully. Um, if we shift what we feel, we get more done, and it's more appealing to people, you know, then negative energy, you know what I mean? We don't just have to build on the negative, we can build on the positive. I don't think anybody in this room would say that the greater culture, the pop culture, really reflects where it should be as far as social activism. We got work to do, right? Um, and we want to be effective, and we want to be relevant, and we want to make an impact, right? And so, as the art of war teaches strategy, is how we move. As artists and activists, we do things on purpose, right? We do things with a purpose, right? And, uh, and we get things done. So I just want to say to close, create, inspire, and empower. Salute. I learned that my time is a little short. And I see that some of you have to leave. Uh, I have about 15 minutes. Um, and I'd like to thank my partner, Stick, for his eloquent presentation, which was scientific and I think uh, very easy for us to ingest. So all of you who understood and overstood what Stick has. My name is Mutulu Olubala. And uh, and I'm one half of Dead Press. Um, where should I start? And I'm going to speak a little quickly uh, just because I want to get a lot into a little bit of time. Um, I'm the namesake of Mutulu Shakur. Uh, Mutulu Shakur is a political prisoner who is a member of the Black Liberation Army, the Black Panther Party, and our uh, uh, African liberation movement as a whole. Uh, he has languished inside prison, this, these prisons, uh, and dungeons of America for the last almost 40 years. 
But I'd like, I like to begin this presentation with great news, that Matula Shakur is coming home. It's due to the power of the people, the relevancy of the campaigns, like, to, and to stick it to what Stick said. Uh, the, the, the Thug Life campaign was, was, was carefully uh, molded by Mutula Shakur because he would say to Tupac, oh, you trying to talk about Thug Life, but I'm in here with the thugs. I know what the thugs are doing. What, what distinguishes your Thug Life from these thugs in here? And this is when the, thug, uh, the code to the thug life was, was, uh, was developed. If anybody doesn't know that there is a code to the thug life, you should look it up. Ten points that uh, talk about how our community sits uh, in social interaction with one another, what we will and what we won't do, what, uh, what is in the lines and what is outside of the lines. So I just want to give kudos to Stick for bringing up Tupac and his rele relevancy for artivism. Wait. So... And I, I, pardon me, because I got to do it fast, because I don't have a lot of time. So my, uh, another mentor of mine is Jamal Joseph. He is a co-defendant with Matula Shakur. Jamal Joseph was a member of the Harlem Black Panther Party. And with Jamal Joseph, I've been working with him, him and his youth organization called Impact. They, they are in Harlem. And uh, a, a few years ago, working with Jamal Joseph, we were talking about what it's going to take to do exactly as Stick said, to impact our community uh, and to do it in a creative way that does it from a positive standpoint um, that allows people to engage. And it was like a couple of years ago where like we kind of, I am going to give attribute it to him, the word artivism. Artivism was created to me. It's the first time I ever heard it and I would give it to OG Jamal Joseph for creating it. If anybody who do doesn't know Jamal Joseph, look up his name. So, uh, for, and just to start that way, um, I would be remiss to stand in front of you today as just a rapper. Um, you would miss a lot of what, uh, of the experiences that made me who I am. I can be summed up that way because I have made rap songs. Um, and, and in some ways, I like to cloak myself in this, in this rapper, um, uh, you know, pseudonym. Uh, because it, it gives me the advantage of going, like Stick said, going in many uh, places and environments and soaking up this energy and using it uh, for the, the true intent and purposes of what I came here to do it for. I am a revolutionary. I am uh, an artist. I, I'm a father. I'm a son. Um, you know, uh, I'm a teacher and a student. And uh, with all that being said, there's a lot of things uh, with us going on at one time, and we have to all be that at one time. Um, I want to thank you for being here because you could have been anywhere today. This particular uh, discussion is truly the most important discussion that we can be having. Why? Because the music that holds a message is uh, sacred. It is sacred to our communities. It gives us a level of political education at which to achieve and the standard by which we can go for. Uh, our music without a message is cool. You can dance to it and sometimes you can laugh. But let's be honest, the music that carries our messages, that carries our, our highest aspirations is the music that stays with us forever and moves on and music that we can play from generation to generation that makes sense. And you ain't got to do it all the time. James Brown made them black and I'm proud, but he made a whole lot of foolishness too. But, and, and so, you know, you, this, this ain't to say that any artist out here has to, to be an artivist. No, it just means we have social responsibility. We have social, because we live in this society. Okay, so uh, with, with that being said, I want to ask you, did you hear about it? Did y'all did hear about the, the, the brother who was slain? The, the, I'm talking about today. Like, yeah, standing like with his mom and, 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 and like the, the police just, just gunned him down. Y'all didn't read about it in the paper? Today. Well, look, I'm joking. It's not true. But I want to, the reason why I even say it that way is because you know that feeling that you just had? We have that feeling a lot. We have this feeling. We, we, we are confronted with this, uh, this contradiction on a daily basis in our community. And, and so then we're left to ask ourselves, because if this did happen, you would ask yourself, what am I going to do right now? What are we going to do right now? What would you do? I think a lot of us feel helpless and hopeless in this particular time when we know our, we are gunned down in our community by the police who are supposed to be there to serve and protect. We, we, are, we, we go through the same old motions 
and expect different outcomes. But uh, with a quick perusal of history, we would give ourselves a, a politi some political education. We would know how to move the next time it happens because we know it's going to happen again. We know. So, so with a quick perusal of, uh, of our recent history, we ain't even got to go that far. Let me just go back to 1991. Uh, okay. In 1991, there was an L.A. motorist named Rodney King. Anybody remember this man? Rodney King was pulled from his vehicle by four L.A. cops as he was driving home from work. He was a construction worker. He was pulled from his car and beaten badly, almost to the point of death. He, the, the whole event was taped by a camcorder by a nearby resident in L.A., California. It was from this camcorder that the world saw it. This depiction was given to the world by the news, which, of course, the propagandists that they are put the spin on the campaign and were able to depict Rodney King, Rodney King as what? As a drunk. They depicted him. It, I, some of you are too young to remember, but they made him a drug dealer. They even cl claimed that he was high, which is the reason why the LAPD had the right to beat on him the way that they did. I don't know if you remember this, but the first step the first step in, uh, in, in, in justice is to vilify the victim. This, and so let's, th this is our quick political education because I think out of this, we're going to learn, I, I think, steps of, of how to use our art to affect social change. Okay. Uh, in the aftermath of, the, of, the, of Rodney King's court case, which happened in 1992, we know that they let all four L.A. police uh, who beat on Rodney King off. And what was the reaction of our community? to right. We set it off. Everywhere, everything was burning. Everywhere was burning. The idea that the LA riots happened changed the consciousness of black people. Why? We had never seen a riot in our community since the 60s. We had not seen riots in our communities. Our resistance had been stamped out since the black revolution of the 60s. The, the, the COINTELPRO which I'll get into a, a little later, made sure that any revolutionary didn't raise his head or was able to defend ourselves or our rights or resist against brutal police attacks the way they were. So our, our community was devoid of any kind of fight back until we saw it after Rodney King was given no justice. Now, this is the anatomy of injustice in the United States of America. This, I'm about to give you the anatomy of injustice. They vilify you the, or, the, the, or the victim and then they go forward and free the state. We've seen that happen over and over and over again. The aftermath of the LA riots not only happened inside LA, it happened in communities all over who were outraged. It happened in Miami. It happened in Atlanta, where the young youth were bre breaking glasses and uh, breaking store window panes downtown and snatching and grabbing anything that we could take. In Brooklyn, New York, the youth left school and abandoned school, said, no, we're not doing that. Rodney King didn't get no justice. We're going to run down the street and get our own brand of justice. In Chicago, Illinois, the same thing happened. But one thing that was particular about Chicago, Illinois, is the home of the largest chapter of the Black Panther Party that ever existed. The leadership of that, black, black, that uh, black Panther Party was named Fred Hampton Sr., Chairman Fred Hampton Sr. of the Black Panther Party. He had been murdered in 1969, and we'll get into that as well. But his son, now his son, Fred Hampton Jr., was accused of being a part of the, the, the ensuing uh, riots that spread across the United States. They claimed that Fred Hampton Jr. was responsible for firebombing a Korean merchant store on the south side of Chicago. And for that, he was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Now, there was not one item burnt in the store. There was not one witness that they, that they used to corroborate his story, yet it was because he was a Black Panther's son that he got these 18 years in prison. Okay. Fast forward, this is in 1992. And something also particularly important happened and interesting happened in 1992. In hip hop music, a classic album was released by uh, Dr. Dre and his crew. This album was called The Chronic. And now I, I point to this because hip hop and activism, hip hop, artivism, I want us to put the two together. One year after Rodney King was, uh, in the same year that Rodney King was given no, no justice, December 1992, The Chronic was released. The whole nation sang this, sang The Chronic. I had never even heard of The Chronic. 
it introduced a level of marijuana to our communities that I had never even seen green weed in my life living in Brooklyn. Weed to me was brown. Okay? But, and, this, and this is not about the weed. This is just about, I, I want to I introduce this because it has a lot to do with the psyche of, of, of our community. Even inside the album, Dr. Dre himself said, as he, out of the aftermath of the L.A. Rebellion, riot said, no medallions, no black fists. It's just that gangster glare. Right? This is the words that came on that album. So, and now when I look back at it, I say, wow, was, was this part of the counterinsurgency? Was this to keep us kind of cool? Was this, I mean, you know, from, from flipping the script, I was all into this gangsterism. This was, the, I, I ain't listened to nothing but this album. You understand? But, uh, and, and, and now that I go back, and I think you all should question this as well, it wouldn't be the first time that the United States government has used music as a way to be a counterinsurgent force against our people. During the turbulent 1960s, they, they, they took terms like Burn Baby Burn, which was popularized by H. Rap Brown, and turned them into dance floor hits. Where instead of being out in the street, we would be on the dance floor boogieing down saying Burn Baby Burn, but the real Burn Baby Burn was associated with communities that needed to be lit a fire because they meant nothing but injustice. They had meant Jim Crow law. They meant uh, uh, no right to vote. They meant um, our children being persecuted in long prison terms and sentences. It, it meant misery in our community. That's why the term Burn Baby Burn rose. But we know because this has been um, uh, given in the Freedom of Information Act that the connection between Motown and the United States government is there. The meetings that happen from the COINTELPRO operations from J. Edgar Hoover's office and the heads of, of black music departments was happening. Songs were being made to keep us down. So don't put this past hip hop music. I only say this so we, so we can get hip. I ain't, this ain't nothing against Dr. Dre. This is just what it is. I want you to be, you, you do the research. I'm only putting it out here. So. Let's fast forward to 1996. That, this was 1992. In 1996, in a little place called St. Petersburg, Florida, which most people never even knew existed on the map. It's a twin city to a place called Tampa, Florida. Well, people only knew St. Petersburg, Florida as a place where old folks go to retire. That's what people knew about this place. Well, there's also a little black community there as well that's that's very poor. So one day, a black youth riding in his super souped up sports gold, gold sports car was driving through downtown St. Petersburg and was pulled over by the police. What happened, what followed, was the police asked him to place his hands out of the window and, uh, and they said that his car kept rolling forward. Witnesses say he was in park, but the two police, a woman and a man, shot him two times in the arm and one in the chest. His name is Tyron Lewis. But what also lived in St. Petersburg was more than old folks and, a, and, a, and just a poor black community was the center of the International African Revolution, a place called the Uhuru House. Now this place, led by Chairman Omalia Chattel and the African People's Socialist Party, had had a 30-year history of unbroken revolution. Now that's hard to say in most countries, most cities, because in most cities they stamped us out with heroin and crack cocaine. They came in and, and, and they murdered people like Fred Hampton Sr. and they murdered us and, and made us exile all across the country. We were in Algeria and, and Cuba like Asada Shakur. But in St. Petersburg, Florida, the, the history of resistance was there. And after the murder of Tyron Lewis, Instead of the media being able to depict for the people who Tyron Lewis was, because you know they were going to do the same thing. We, this, don't, don't forget the anatomy of injustice in America. They were going to vilify that brother. But before they were able to do it, this organization who had history and had uh, practice in uh, revolutionary understanding was able to hit the community full speed, sent activists who had been trained to go out with leaflets. And said, with a, with a leaflet, and they said, uh, they were able to say, here, let's, t let's talk about it. Let's meet in our community. This is who Tyron Lewis was. This is who his grandmother was. This is who his family is. Meet us over here, and we can talk about it. Long story short, there began a town hall meeting in this local organizing center. This happened outside of the local government, and the police didn't like that. We were able to organize our own thoughts around who Tyron Lewis was before they got to us. Take this one in. My point being, 
Uh, and, and what happened was, the, not only did the police call that meeting unlawful, they called this town hall meeting amongst black people unlawful. Why? We didn't want the news to come, and we didn't want the preachers to come, and we, well, you know, the Uncle Tom preachers, the, you know, we didn't want them to come. We wanted to have this, this, this talk uh, uh, amongst ourselves, and the, the police outlawed the meeting on the news and said, if you go there, we're going to call it martial law. And the people came to the thing anyway. And you know what the police did? The police used every canister of tear gas that they had in that county and the next county on that building to keep the people out the building. And when the people still wouldn't leave the building, they lit fire to the top of the building so the people couldn't organize. My point being, five minutes I have, my point being, what followed in the next three days in St. Petersburg, Florida, was called, and is still called in Wikipedia if you look it up, the St. Petersburg Rebellion. Now, there's a qualitative difference between a riot and a rebellion. What is that difference? The difference is organization. Organization. Yeah, we had angst and we pulled Reginald Denny, Denny out the truck and beat him to death, but there were no demands, there were no goals. Nobody, was meant, what, nobody paid a specific price for the death or for the injustice against Rodney King. But we were damn sure going to get justice for Tyron Lewis. Long story short, me and my partner got together. And we, we, get, we after these experiences, um, because uh, cause life is real, and we put a lot of this stuff into our music that, that became Dead, Dead Prez's experiences. We, we talked about uh, what it meant to have food, clothes, and a shelter. We, 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 uh, we, my partner had a, a hook that went, a nigga need food. You got to have food for your health and clothes. Gear to keep esteem for yourself, son, shelter. A place to lay for rest when you stressed over life. And it's trife and ain't no God gonna help you. And these are kind of, these became like basic, uh, basic tools that we would use that, and, and not in book form, but in music form that would help us be able to identify what, if we didn't need Beamers, Benz, and, and Bentleys, we needed food, clothes, and shelter. We were able to quickly identify it inside our music and put it in our musical space. Organizing in, uh, in political prisoner campaigns helped us to make songs about political prisoners. Organizing, uh, uh, knowing that we have been defeated by alcoholism and cigarettes and all kind of other shit helped us to be able to write songs about our health. Uh, you know, these are things that uh, I think it's, it's imperative that artists be able to do in our music. Not, it, not be revolutionaries, but talk about your, so your social experience. Why wouldn't we? Let's, let, you know, the most important thing about the artists that I really love, including Tupac, was that he talked about the world around him. Now, whether, what he saw, whether he reported it and it was good for him to report it or bad, whether he was in a hot tub full of women or whether he was, talk, like Stick said, talking about what we're going to do in the community on the front line, he was talking about what was happening in our community. There was no abstract in the club. It was no abstract um, lying about uh, material things that we don't have. That, those abstractions did not happen. At least we were able to be connected. And this is the, the base of what artivism can be and should be uh, at the end of the day. Um, and to close, um, I'm an Af African internationalist based on the political theory of Amalia Shetela, and I have to say that, the Uhuru movement, you should know. But African internationalism had led me, has led me to understand that hip hop is a language that crosses all barriers and borders. Uh, we're speaking the language of hip hop in each and every place in the world talking about our issues. It's only in America that this thing is uh, a circus of what we, what we think we want to have and what we really don't have. In places like the Gaza Strip where I was able to go w through Egypt and talk to young artists who, uh, who are using their, and, and even rapping is illegal in Palestine, but these artists are using this tool still. In Ramallah, I was able to connect with the Ramallah Underground and, and, uh, uh, and these other groups to be able to identify that we have having the same checkpoints in Ramallah as we have in Brooklyn, as we have in Denver. We have the same checkpoints. So uh, internationally, I think uh, our voice is, uh, is truly an important place. Everybody is looking toward America for a, a, a way to lead out. And our artists, as Mao Zedong said, are a, uh, a, a, a temperature gauge, are a gauge to the political maturity of where our people are. Now, if our artists are not talking about what's happening politically, then you know where the minds of the masses are. So we got to raise that up. 
We got to raise that up, inject that into the music. Um, I'm, in, I'm in Kenya, organizing with the, the Mau Mau youth, Ukuflani Mau Mau. I'm in Tanzania. I, I was able to meet Geronimo Pratt and his son uh, in, in Tanzania, in Mozambique, like I said, in Egypt, in Senegal and Gambia, Senegambia, to hook up with the local artists who were able to uh, use hip hop to change the local election. There was a regime change in Senegal. If nobody knows about African news, there was a, a regime change. Over 40 years of the same leader changed because of what hip hop was doing in, in Senegal and Burkina Faso and Guinea Bissau. Anybody who doesn't know the name Thomas Sankara, we may know Kwame Nkrumah, we know Patrice Lumumba. If you don't know, then you should know. But if you don't know Thomas Sankara, this is who I want to be. This is who I want to be. If you want to know what M1 wants to do in his life, look, who, look up Thomas Sankara. Yes, he was a guitarist, but he also was the creator of the United States of Africa. It was this idea that he took to all this. And you know what? Most of African states would not unite with him. And it was the reason why he was murdered. Because this idea was too powerful. As, and we've not even been able to achieve it today. Because neo-colonialism and neo-colonialism runs rampant today. But it is, the, it is artivism. It is activism that can speak the language between us that says, if we got a problem in Africa, then you got a problem with Africans in Denver. If you got a problem with Africans in LA, you got a problem in Senegal. This is what African internationalism can do for hip hop music. Um, and with that being said, um, wow. I'm so sorry I had to rush through it, but I just want to tell you that, that um, I just want to tell you, hold on. I began an album called Battle Cry for Cuba and, Cuba and, and Zimbabwe. This is a, this album, um, it's not even an album, it's a series. It's in its third series. We created our, we're, we're in our third CD. Uh, a brother named Obi Agbuna, who is the United States correspondent with Zimbabwe, helped me come up with this concept where we would take artists and talk about the sanctions that, ha that are happening against Zim Zimbabwe, are put on Zimbabwe by the US, which are similar to the same sanctions that are put against Cuba. So this, uh, this album is called Battle Cry, for Cuba and, and Zimbabwe. Um, I just wanted to tell you. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, it's because of the kind of artistry that Dead Press has been able to do that I developed a relationship with political prisons. I want to say free them all. That's Mondo Poindexter, Sekou Odinga, Herman Bell, Russell Maroon Schultz, and Mumia Abu-Jamal. And, and I want to say this to Mumia Abu-Jamal. Uh, two days ago, Mumia Abu-Jamal asked me to be his representative uh, outwardly to the world. Uh, due to the recent death of Ruby D and the long-standing work of Angela Davis, who, has, who have both been holding their campaign down for over 10 years, they understood what needs to be done. I mean, Mumia has made some fantastic changes. He's not on death row. He's still in prison. That's not, it's not good enough, right? It's not good enough. But I am gladly accepting that position, succeeding Angela Davis and Ruby D, because he has told me I have an understanding about where the art can affect our community. Not saying that Ruby D and Angela Davis do not, but my particular position and what we have laid out as dead prayers has allowed uh, me the experiences that to bring to you, to bring new life to our political prisoners and political prison campaigns. With that being said, I hope I can come talk to you again and thank you. This particular meeting was extremely important. If we ain't talking about message music, we, you know, you gotta support it. The same way you support trap and the same way you support all of that, there needs to be a category. I know it, sound, it might sound crazy, but Gil Scott Heron said in the message to the messengers, and if you don't know about the message to the messengers, that we got to get it up here. We got to do our political education. So uh, I'm glad to be here. I, wanna, I, I would like for you all to, to uh, continue to hold your head high, to, to learn the science, the art and science. Revolution is a delicate art and science that must be mastered before we can see any kind of result. It is an art and a science. We have to delicately balance them in order to get some real results. Thank you all. Heighten the contradiction.